uh, so we will start. Uh, my name is George Jensen. I'm chair of the Montclair Historical Society. And uh, I want to start by thanking the others that have uh, played a part in this. Jennifer Dennison, who has done the major promotion on this event. Catherine Guerr, who's you know, as you came in. And uh, Corinne Cooper did some research for me, which we'll talk about in a minute. Uh, Jennifer Boyer and Paul Carnahan, who did more work than I did on this, even though the three of us have shared uh, equal billing. So, uh, just a couple of words about uh, I'm making a pitch here of what you can do for your local historical society. And uh, I'm a big one to pitch to everyone to life, to write their life story. Everybody rolls their eyes, they think nobody cares. But a local person who I could name, but I won't, recently gave me his life story he'd just written. He went to his attorney and she said, you have a life story, I'll go home and write it. And he went home and wrote it. And uh, it, it's good for your family, it's good for the historical society, and, and I'm a big proponent about writing your life story. Also, we would invite your participation in conducting some local research. And Mark Twain said, write about whatever interests you at the time. So, write about anything. Write about your vocation, your job, uh, local organizations you've been involved with. It may seem boring to you, it's current, but contemporary history becomes history history in time. So uh, we, we would encourage you to do that. And uh, we are involved with video histories, and we would invite people to help us with that by doing some video histories, and we would invite you to suggest to us any people that we might do video histories of. So, uh, a quick show and tell just to show you the kinds of little things that we've been getting lately. Here is a Misco Seal Beverage Company bottle, Montpelier, Vermont. Uh, I bought this on eBay within the last few weeks. Uh, Harry Slade Pharmacist, Montpelier, Vermont. A small metal box. You all are very aware of the Montpelier and of the U.S. clothespin and the other clothespin company. And I happen to have possession of this. My father passed it down. So not only is it a mint condition uh, box full, but it is an unusual double clothespin. <laughs> so things like this, uh, there's not too many of them around. And just oh, two more things. Again, more contemporary, not too old, but golden dome beer glass. And lastly, across baking, across cracker box. Uh, many of you might remember across baking. So anyway, that's, and, and the most exciting thing is the following. I received this email on August 17th of last year, 10 months ago. Uh, I won't read the whole thing. Dear friends, today I documented a melodeon made in Montpelier between 1845 and 1855 by G.H. Nichols. This is from a guy in Maine, and he says that the lady that brought it to him is willing to give it away. And this week I picked it up at the S.E. Oregon Museum in Brattleboro, and I haven't even unwrapped it yet. But I asked Corinne Cooper, who is our primary, or pre one of our premier researchers, uh, to look it up. Last night, I sent her an email asking her to do it. I have six pages <laughs> of ads for this guy and his store on State Street and all kinds of stuff about organs. Uh, I, I, I bet there might be nobody here that knows that this guy made organs. So we will be putting that on display in some storefront downtown and so that's that's kind of what we're doing and lastly and not leastly is space needs we would like some permanent space we have some borrowed space which we're very appreciative of but we need space to catalog our collection we need space to store our collection and it could we could use it for meeting space. But anyway, we like space. So we're always pitching, making that pitch. So that's everything. Paul, that wasn't too long. But anyway, so I would turn this over to Paul. 
who will start our presentation on East State Street, half a mile of history. Thank you, George. As George says, we are here to talk about the buildings and people of one street in Montpelier, East State Street. The program is sponsored by you, our members, and also by Karen Gillis and Shems, attorneys at law, who just happen to be located on East State Street. <laughs> Why are we looking at East State Street? Of all the other streets in Montpelier that we could look at, there are a couple of reasons. First, it's an interesting street, capturing several people, businesses, and institutions. And second, quite frankly, it's a street that included buildings and people that the three of us had researched independently. And we thought it would be fun to pull it all together in one place and talk about one swath of Montpelier. I should mention that I'm having trouble advancing the text here. So, how does that work? There we go. Okay, yeah, yeah, the cursor has to be in the... Smaller A. Uh, no, sure it, yeah, yeah. Um, I should mention that we're going to talk that while we're going to talk about quite a large number of properties on East State Street, we aren't going to talk about every single building. So if we didn't mention a building that you own or that you're that's a favorite of your buildings, I apologize in advance, but we didn't have time to research absolutely every building. Uh, we're going to start at the bottom of the hill. That's interesting. There's a screensaver on this computer <laughs> that hasn't been turned off. This is a very long street there. <laughs> okay, we're learning all sorts of new things here about this computer. Um, so we're going to start at the bottom of the hill, logical place, work our way up to the college green. Each of us are going to take turns, and hopefully we can make the transitions smooth. I'm going to start here to set the scene. This is Montpelier, circa 1860, looking east down State Street with the Winooski River there on the right, the lower right. Uh, east State Street did not exist yet. Perhaps the most prominent building here is labeled. It's the old Utenry School, which stood there in that form from 1857 until 1939 at the location of the current Union Elementary School. So that's Montpelier before East State Street. This is the same view, only a little closer, 15 years later. As you can see, what will become East State Street is now a dirt path, and development has started on Seminary Hill. In this view, we can see several buildings that will attract our attention, and then we'll talk about in a few minutes. Let me see if I can pull this off. I'm not sure I'm going to because the angle is sort of odd. But we're going to talk about Eliza Guernsey's house, 48, right there, East State Street. We're going to talk about number 56, which is right there, which is the Brigham Cross House. We're going to talk about 100 East State Street, that's right there. That's the Gilman Marvin Jones house. And the building over to the side, right around there. Um, is 99 to 101, which is part of the Civil War Hospital. Prominent in the photograph, of course, in the upper right-hand corner, is the uh, Vermont Methodist Seminary, whose central building we now call College Hall. It was built just two years before this photograph was taken. East State Street, of course, starts here at Main Street. There was a very large building with an opening in it known as the Arch Building, or the Spalding Block, after John Spalding, the man who erected the building. The arch in the building gave access to the back of the buildings where a livery stable and some tenements, or apartment buildings, were located, and to the dirt path that led up the hill to the fairgrounds at the top of the hill where the college is now. This is what the area looked like in 1853, according to a map of the city published by Presidy and Edwards. You can see the arch building closing off full access to the street. And then we've labeled uh, East State Street and School Street just so you can get oriented. The building on the south side of the arch building 
the one with the Freeman office sign, is the Willard Block, built circa 1840, now one of the oldest buildings in the downtown. It was owned by Charles Willard, owner and editor of the Green Mountain Freeman, one of the most influential newspapers of its day. Now it's owned by the Heaney family and currently houses Bohemian Bakery and other businesses. Here's a closer look at that building and the Willard Block on the right. Can't quite see it, but the Montpelier Fire Department is lined up in front of the building. And George is going to talk a little more about the fire department in just a few minutes. Here's yet a closer view. And one of the things I love about this picture is the way all those signs are tacked on the front of the building, hanging every which way. I think you can even see some signs posted on top of other signs. Yes, the one, uh, the one right here. And they didn't bother to remove the old sign, but just put, put new ones on it. According to an article in the Vermont Watchman and State Journal, in 1882, several citizens petitioned the town of Montpelier, and it was a town at that point, to establish a public road through the arch. The petitioners testified that the right of way through the arch had become, quote, one of the most important thoroughfares in town, that by actual count, the daily average travel of individuals and teams in ordinary times is more than 1,000. Can you believe that? I don't know. A thousand travels through there. Uh, that the arch is so often obstructed by teams, especially in rainy days, as to be impassable even for pedestrians, and that it is so infested with intoxicated men and loafers <laughs> as to be dangerous, especially for ladies in the evening. Unquote. This was not a new request. In 1868, 14 years earlier, the Slackman had entertained a similar request, but turned it down as being too expensive. However, a public highway was established from the back of the building up to Seminary Hill with a right of way through the, through the arch. It wasn't a public highway, but you could get through there. The town fathers, and yes, they were all men, must have come to terms with the situation and the cost because the arch building was demolished the following year after the petition that would have been 1883, to make room for a public highway, as they called it. And thanks to Paul Heller for providing us with the uh, newspaper article from which this uh, colorful story comes. And I have copies of the full article later. Um, if you think things are contentious in Montpelier now, things have been contentious for a long period of time, including in the 1880s. Um, there were quite a few businessmen who did not want the opening in that, uh, in that building. But you'll have to read the article to find out why. OK, so in 1883, the arch building comes down. And here's the same view, with the street opened up and with the uh, Willard building still, still standing. And here's a closer look. One of the things about uh, historical photographs that I like is being able to zoom in. Historical photographs and technology is being able to, to zoom in. And you can see some of the buildings on the north side of um, East State Street there, which George will tell us about in just a second. This is an artist's view of what the bottom of East State Street looked like in 1884 after the arch building was removed. George is going to tell us about this row of buildings right here on the north side of the street. I will be back to talk about this building right here and some of the buildings on that side. And then Jennifer is going to talk about the buildings right here at the corner of uh, Cedar and East State Street. So now I'm going to turn it over to George. And we advance now. There's the, what's that? Advance? Okay. The left and right. Okay. And to, and to scroll to scroll this, you move the, the cursor. Okay. Or you can do two fingers. Okay. <coughs> Sanborn maps were made for the purpose of insurance rating and were produced over a period of 40 or 50 years from the late 1800s into the 1900s. They have been proven to be a valuable record of buildings and streets and infrastructure. This first one shows the beginning of East State Street in 1884, right after the Arch Building was gone. And it was, in fact, called Arch Street. 
The top building that I'm pointing to is the Cross Baking Company, which is labeled. And it even shows the pink section, which are the ovens, right in the middle of the building, and that are the ovens. Sanborn maps showed brick structures in pink. The Sanborn map says this is the cracker manufacturing. A little side story here is that Charles Cross was known to expand his bakery building by buying nearby barns and adding them to the end of his building. You can clearly see from the irregular shape of the buildings that that's exactly what he did. This was not uncommon. You will see it all over downtown. He even moved two buildings down East State Street from the Sloan Civil War Hospital when it closed. Jennifer will discuss this later. My family owned cross banking from 1908 until 1980. The building marked Future Fire Station is the Future Fire Station. <laughs> right there. This now you think I'm going backwards, Paul? Yep, yeah. yeah. Here is one of the most classic of photos of East State Street, and it is easy to date. This would be the morning of November 4th, 1927, the day after the big flood. This is the very beginning of East State with a building Paul called the Willard Block, but which most of us call the Heaney Building on the right, and what at the time was the Gleason Building on the left. My father told me that the submerged truck in the foreground was a cross truck. And if you zoom in, which you are able to, you can actually read the lettering on the side of the truck. An unoccupied wooden rowboat floats beside it. See the crowd of onlookers at the water's edge up East State Street. This is a view from the other direction. You can see the former bank building at the end of the street. This 1889 Sanborn map shows for the first time the fire station <coughs> labeled as O's headquarters. The following three photos have been provided by Robert Schnetzinger, an official or unofficial historian of the Montpelier Fire Department. They are all undated, but this is probably the oldest. Volunteer Hose Company number one was organized in 1884 and this photo might well be about that vintage. The fire station building is long gone, but the building in the background was there up until city center was built in the 80s. In the 50s, it was Vermont Business Equipment. In 1980, Vermont Business Equipment lost its location in that block that burned before it was replaced with city center. It was run by Frank Kieser and then bought by Arthur E. Fitch. After the fire, his son Todd moved it to the current Vermont liquor store location on Main Street. He closed it soon after getting flooded in 1992. Arthur's daughter, Martha Fish, is the longtime director of the Vermont Craft Council and started the Artisan's Hand in 1978 with Jennifer and 14 other craftspeople. This is a fantastic photo, and I call it fantastic because it's so clear. Uh, these were all probably made from glass negatives, and glass negatives uh, properly exposed have a, uh, a propensity to really make them sharp. This shows a fire wagon in front of the fire station. On the left, we see another livery stable. The Dudley stable is in every picture. Down on the left corner, you see the original Willard block that is still very prominent today, and straight ahead, the block built by James Langdon former home to TD Bank. The building to the right was there until city center was built. This photo, this shows the one horse wagon and sports their sign over the door, number one volunteer hose company. Horses were provided by Putney Stables, which were directly across the street. They were housed in box stalls at the rear of the apparatus floor, and that would be a cross building in the background. Another photo from Robert Snetzinger. This photo is not uh, a local photo, but that is our truck. This was the first engine-powered truck added to the Montpelier Fire Department. 1915 Sanborn map with the fire station labeled as Fire Department, five men, 
three horses, two horse hose wagon, one horse hose wagon, and 2,000 feet of two and a half inch hose. This next map is undated and was copied from a map found in City Hall that is now inaccessible due to the flood. This one could have been as late as the 40s or 50s, and this is the Cody block that we knew in the 50s and 60s that was burned in 1980. It was originally the French block. This was the first national grocery store and then later served other purposes, including a temporary post office. Here in the corner was the children's <laughs> store. This building was the All-American Diner. The diner was right along in there. The children's store was there. Some of you may remember that. And above the All-American Diner was a candle pin bowling alley on the second floor. Cross Bakery was demolished and the Cody block burned and the area was developed as city center. Jewett Hardware was an operating hardware store in the 50s and that's way back in this little alley. As a six or eight year old, I would walk down from Liberty Street to that hardware store, buy a little bag of nails so I could go back home and build another shack. I have continued to be a hobby builder as an adult. This building here was the cross banking garage. You'll see it in a later, hard to see here from the side, the later slide. James G. French built 85 Main Street, a simple brick block at the bottom of East State Street in 1884, after the old arch building that straddled the street was torn down. French lived just up the street next to the Unitarian Church in a building that still stands. He owned a profitable clothing store and was postmaster from 1861 to 69. This is a view of the corner itself showing the children's store that building was Gleason's back in the early 1900s, selling furniture and clothing. It was a large business occupying over 15,000 square feet on three floors. As you go around the corner, the All-American Diner was located in that section of the building. This section was added by the Cody family after they purchased the entire corner. This slide shows an ad from H.J. Volholm Business. Volholm was an immigrant from Scandinavia who lived on First Avenue, and as you can see, he lists his business as being on the corner of Main, M-A-I-N-E, and East State Street. He's also advertising couch hammocks, porch furniture, and go-karts. I tried to find out what a go-kart would have been at that age, and couldn't find a thing about it. It's probably some kind of furniture. At any rate, he joined the Gleason family's furniture and dry goods store, and after working for them, uh, he went into business for himself. This is the Cody building from the front on Main Street. It was there in the 70s before the fire that burned it on December 20th, 1980. And to the left, you see the wood frame bakery building. And no, nope, you can't quite see the church, but the church would be just to the left of that. To the right is the children's store that was on the corner of State and Main. This is the building I previously mentioned in that very old photo. It's actually two buildings put together as can be seen from the top view of the Sanborn map. This was not unusual back then. They would either build it as an addition or combine the two buildings that existed there. In this case, the windows are consistent, just the fact that these middle windows are closer together is a clue. Then they would combine the top cornice trim to finish the effect. In the 50s, there was a candle pin bowling alley, as I mentioned, operated by the Cody family, which was originally not mechanized. That is to say, the pins were reset after every string by a human pin setter, usually about 12 years old. <laughs> the first floor was occupied by the All-American Diner. This building was owned by A.D. Hayes, who was a car dealer who sold Dodge cars. He would later become the cross-baking garage. 
It was bought by the Cross Bakery and turned into their repair facility and the truck storage building. Holson was the brand name for the bread produced by the Cross Bakery. Um, no, 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 okay. no, 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 Olson was a brand name for the bread produced by the Cross Bakery, and the product was distributed over three states from this location. Paul is a, a factory in downtown Montpelier, kind of a kind of a strange uh, situation. Paul is going to pick up with the building next to this one. Okay, and I just um, I, this is East State Street in front of it. We're moving up East State Street now, just to. Uh, orient you to where, where we are at the moment. So I'd like to talk about this seemingly unpretentious building that's on the edge of George's last slide. This is actually a very old building, circa 1848, which if you've been keeping track, is 34 years before the arch building was removed. Does it say thrift store? Yes. To tell the story of this building, let's look at State Street on May 30th, 1874, before East State Street was even created. We're looking westerly toward the State House, although you can't see it in the picture. However, you can see the edge of the courthouse portico on the far right and some beautiful elms lining the street. And right down the street is the building that is now at 28 East State Street. Right there. As you can see, it's the same building minus the columns in front. And you can see that the, uh, the pattern of the uh, windows are all the same, right? Uh, this had a tri triangular uh, vent, and they uh, they finished off the upper floors and put in windows. But it's the same, and this detail is the same both buildings. And right next to it, is the building that's now at 36 East State Street, which is that building. 36 gained a small overhang over the front doors and lost some windows on the side of the building, but otherwise it's the same building. How did these two buildings get to East State Street? They were dragged to the center of town and across the Rialto Bridge. A newspaper article from the time tells the story of the building being decorated with amusing signs, or at least the author of the article thought they were amusing for the time, as it stood in the middle of the street over a Saturday night. But, quote, all were removed before the hour of morning services in the churches on Sunday. <laughs> Very important to get things cleaned up for churches on Sunday. So they must have been moved before or after the arch building was taken down? After the arch building was taken down, yeah. yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And as that area of the uh, street was being developed, the newspapers talk about um, the person who moved it doing a good job um, developing that, that part of the street. Next to number 36 is number 44, which houses the offices of our sponsor, Karen, Gillis, and Shams. It was first built at the end of the 1890s and eventually was owned by John and Annie Miller. John was an adventurer when he was young joining the U.S. Navy and going before the mast, according to the newspapers. That phrase was used to describe sailors going to sea in the days of sailing ships. He most likely sailed on the newer steam vessels and saw Egypt and the pyramids. Back in Montpelier, he married Annie. They bought number 44 and rented rooms to Dr. M.F. McGuire, a busy surgeon at Heaton Hospital. But John had ongoing health problems and died at age 47. Annie was alone for 10 years before marrying a different man with the same first name, John McGuire, the brother of her doctor tenant. In the 1950s, twice a year at Easter and Christmas, a descendant named Mary K. McGuire advertised her fruitcakes in the newspapers to be picked up at her house at number 44. The McGuire family owned the house from the late 1800s until the 1950s. Okay, now I'm going back down to the beginning of the street, but on the other side. 
Um, on the south side of the street stood this row of tenements. Uh, you can see them in the bird's eye right there. Uh, I don't know the year that they were built. But they were probably built 1883 after the street was opened and because they show up on the 1884 Sandmore map and on this bird's eye in the same year. In the photograph, you can also sort of see the Blanchard block peeking out from behind. So you sort of know where, where we are now. In 1940, this building was moved down the street and turned 90 degrees to make room for the AMP building, now known as the Harry Sheridan Building, or the Vermont Center for Independent Living Building. This was what the old 1883 tenement building looked like in 1990. Soon after the previous photo was taken, the building was demolished by its owners, Milton and Joan Beard, and replaced by this modern building, following the footprint and the form of the older building that stood on the site. This is the building that replaced that one tenement building, a building built by Harry Sheridan in 1940, specifically for the AMP Super Service Market. It is seen here in the late 40s with its original ornamentation. The vaguely modern style did not last long. In the 1950s, the curves of the parapet wall, corner lamps, and clock were removed in favor of the present squared off design. It was really quite an attractive building with the clock and the, uh, the lights in the corner, and the, uh, the brickwork was even a little different. I couldn't find any articles that described exactly when or why uh, this was changed, but it had a, a streamlined look in the, uh, the 1940s version. AMP left town in 1975, and the building struggled to find a tenant. International Coins and Currency was eventually a longtime tenant and owner. As I mentioned earlier, the building is now owned by and used by Vermont Center for Independent Living. Although it was hit very hard by the flood, by the July 2023 flood, it's not presently occupied, although they have told me that they are, in fact, planning to move, that, move back there eventually. This is a quick view of a taxi stand that used to be located at the back of the Heaney building and next to the AMP. So you can see a little sign up above there, and these are the taxis waiting to be called into service. And I love the, uh, the signage on the very corner of the building there, uh, headed directed toward uh, Main Street so that people who were walking on Main Street or driving along the Main Street could uh, know what the building was for. Now over to Jennifer. How's this sound? Um, so backing up a little bit, let's talk about the street um, as it went through the Arch Building and up the hill away from State and Main in 1853. The area of the old fairground, um, which is known in here, um, was the, uh, the first state state street remained a wild land because the unpredictable nature of the clay river valley soil. It, it was used, the trail was used to get up to the race course and fairground on the plateau where the college green is now. The orange oval on the big map shows where the map maker wrote to race course on the steep hill. Um, it shows that, uh, that S. Prentice owned a narrow area of high land at the north edge of the street. Um, I think this is the location of 100 East State Street that Paul will discuss soon. The northern part of this area would later become Bingham and Marvin Streets. As an example of how wild and woolly this neighborhood was, Sandworm map maps skip it entirely or split it into two maps. So we'll rely on Google to get oriented. This section of East State Street on the north side became developed when the Union School that preceded the current elementary school on School Street was planned in the 1800s. A large lot bought by the school district bordered East State Street on that north side, and the house lots were sold after the Union School was finished in 1859. We're going to look at number 48 um, at the corner of Cedar Street number 54, just up the hill, and number 55, across the street, up on a knoll, the current Martin Apartments. 
Um, uh, at that time, land records showed titles for land lots, but also spring rights, since town water was not available yet. Also, homeowners took care of adding wooden sidewalks, um, and those were mentioned in land titles, too. Um, water mains would become available around 1884. Eliza V. Guernsey was one of the first owners of number 48 East State Street, shown here at the upper right corner of East State and Cedar Streets. She was an unorthodox real estate developer of the late 1800s. Born in Calais in 1821, she moved to Montpelier and by the 1850s had a thriving seamstress business with many employees, winning prizes for her clothing at the Vermont State Fairs. She was married only once to a man who turned out to be, who turned out to be a seven times married serial bigamist <laughs> named L.A. Abbott. He wrote a book about himself titled Seven Wives, Seven Prisons. <laughs> she had the marriage annulled promptly, um, but gossip and judgment were rampant in the newspapers, often blaming the victim, and Eliza's reputation in business suffered. She started a, a run, a run, running a small boarding house, and her friends called number 48 the House of Seven Gables, since she kept updating it to add more of those. Um, a later article in the paper referred to her as a, quote, odd character, unquote, and she seemed to attract attention. She eventually took in her two sisters, her blind sister Phoebe and her severely mentally ill sister Arminda, who had previously spent decades at two different um, state insane asylums. This bird's eye view, um, let's see, wait a minute. Yeah, this bird's eye view um, map clipping is from the wonderful 1884 Norris map, hand drawn by A.F. Poole. This image reminds me of where it's Waldo. Um, the, the, origin, uh, the original map shows the whole of Montpelier. Um, keep number 48, Eliza's house, um, at the corner of East State Street in mind as we zoom in to the next slide. After a number of years, um, Eliza decided to improve the living conditions of her insane sister, Arminda, whose erratic, sometimes violent behavior was a problem for everyone's safety. Eliza built a little complex more suited to Arminda's special needs, next to number 48, shown here as Eliza's octagons. The new complex had an interior cage and also an outside area with a high fence to give her sister as much freedom as possible. The buildings um, were the two octagons and other buildings shown here next to number 48, um, to the right of the word cedar. Um, it's remarkable that Mr. Poole shows the octagons um, in this 1884 map. They only stayed in place for a few years. Newspaper articles show that Eliza was a regular gadfly at the State House, advocating for better care for the insane. By 1889, um, our, the sisters, Arminda and Phoebe, had passed away. Eliza, now 68 years old, decided to build a new tenement, um, now number 55 at the bottom left of the map. She sold her two houses across the street, number 48 and what would be number 54, the octagons. Um, and according to the newspaper, she purchased, quote, purchased a lot on the opposite side of East State Street near the summit of a high hill overlooking the entire village. If the clay bank upon which the house is built does not slide out next spring, she will be all right. <laughs> um, unquote. Whoops. Um, she had one of the octagons from her old complex moved out onto, eight, onto East State Street. According to the papers, it remained there for three weeks in the middle of the highway, bolstered up by blocks. In the meantime, Miss Guernsey had her, um, this is a quote, had her cooking stove set up outdoors, the pipe being attached to an electric light pole. She cooked out there, rain or shine, unquote. Workers finally raised the octagon, octagon 20 feet and slid it out onto the high clay bank to include in her number 55 house. There's no proof that the current um, bay window on number 55 uh, number, number 55, shown here, is the original octagon that was moved, but I choose to believe it might be. 
Um, the current owner of the house showed me the substantial granite foundation um, that the bay window rests on. Eliza um, only had the tenement for a few years before her health declined and she sold it. W.C. Walker bought it after work had been done on the high bank to lower it. Eliza died in 1895 at age 74. When Eliza sold her old octagon property, minus one octagon, to her neighbor, Charles H. Cross of Cross Baking, um, he was living on uh, number, six, 56, uh, number 56 East State Street up the hill. The sales agreement stated that Eliza must move or raise her collection of buildings and have the foundation filled in. Charles then built the current um, number 54 on the left, probably as a tenement. I leave it to your imagination as to what went on between Eliza and Charles as they designed these two buildings across the street from each other. They seem to have a similar taste in terms of three-story bay windows. Charles was the owner of the thriving bakery um, building uh, George has introduced us to. Luckily, number 55 is 135 years old and it hasn't slid off the hill yet. But that is a th as thanks to some active remediation of the terrain. W.C. Walker owned it in the late 1890s and lost patience with Eliza's adventurous location of the house. Newspapers detail numerous accidents on his property over the years. One time in January 1898, a delivery horse and sleigh with two people in it slid off the driveway eight feet onto East State Street. But luckily, there were no injuries to man, beast, or sleigh. Um, also in 1889, the paper recounts, quote, W.C. Walker's house lot is smaller than it was yesterday. After a heavy rain, several hundred feet of cubic feet of clay slid down into East State Street from the front side of Mr. Walker's lawn. The slide included several trees, one of which, a good-sized apple tree, came down right side up as naturally as, as if it grown, were grown in the street. These are just two articles that we found. The solution was the big wall. It was a combined effort between W.C. Walker and the um, city council. Uh, George Edson grew up in the neighborhood and wonders how many of us have passed that wall without thinking too much about it. In 1880, uh, 1898, there was a, a, quite a squabble in city council meetings about who should pay for solving the East State Street problem. After lively debate noted in the papers, a solution was decided on. Um, uh, the, they would share the expense. Um, Walker, agreed, oops, Walker agreed to take charge of removing a sizable amount of clay leveling his lot more to prepare for the granite retaining wall to be built by the city. He was able to cart the clay over to the Union School property, where they used it for leveling their grounds. The granite wall would be built using large blocks of buried granite brought by train. It ended up 270 feet long and 14 feet at its highest point and cost $3,500. What do I do? <laughs> Okay, sorry about that. This is my computer, it's my fault. <laughs> the paper, um, the, let's see, uh, the paper said this will prevent any further clay mires, this is a quote, um, which have been a regular thing. I didn't know they used the word thing back then. Um, after all the ac acrimony about planning of the wall, it was built very quickly considering its size. Um, Let's see, did I do the right thing? Yes. Um, Public Works Director um, Tom McCardle retired in 2019 after 38 years with the city. Um, he told us about a tooth in the wall mortar. John Snell filled us in on the details. He remembers watching two workers um, repointing the wall in the late 1980s and one of them added his newly extracted molar, just fresh that day, to the fresh mortar. Um, I looked recently and did not find it, but I did find some interesting treasures um, added by neighbors. 
John gave us a picture of this picture of the tooth. It turns out that the VPR show, Brave Little State, did some more research. Listen to that episode, it's very entertaining. If anyone finds the tooth or any other treasures added by neighborhood children, please treat the collection with care. Mike Doyle of Doyle's Guest House on School Street grew up in the neighborhood, and he thinks the old, that the oldest, possibly original mortar from 1898 is this darker uh, mortar that has the patterns in it. Um, there would be no East State Street without it, uh, without the wall. Eliza's crazy idea helped start it all. And uh, Mike, oh, this is kind of changing perspectives here. Mike Doyle's uh, memories of his childhood in Montpelier involve an area of woods that is down the hill from the next two buildings that we will look at. We've left number 48 and 54 at the corner of East State Street and Cedar Streets to visit number 56, the yellow building with the big parking lot, and number 58, the brick office building. Mike remembers um, that the wooded area between these buildings and the Union School at the upper right here was a wonderful gathering, gathering place for kids from all over the neighborhood. There were, and still are, paths all through the woods. One of the paths ran from the Union School at the top of the big retaining wall behind the Hodgson and Cross houses at number 37 and 39 School Street. Um, Mike said it was a thrill to jump off the 10-foot wall. Uh, um, what could go wrong? <laughs> Um, it was uh, not made of granite. Um, it was probably built by the landowners to keep the hill from crumbling into their backyards, and it still does its job now. Also, the yellow Brigham Cross house above it might have started sliding down without this wall. The stone reminds me of the rocks used to build Hubbard Park Tower. Take note of the LB Cross house um, that's on here. It's marked in the yellow at the top. Um, number 55, um, and, and number 55 that says Brigham. We'll visit these folks next. Number 56 State Street was also built on one of the plots sold by the Union School District when the school was built in 1968. The house was built by Gershon Nelson Brigham, a prominent, prominent homeopathic doctor who would lead the State Homeopathic Society, and he was an avid poet. He published a book of his poems. He and his family followed the stream of Vermonters moving west in the late 1800s. They ended up in Michigan. The next owner of number 56 was the Cross family that George mentioned. Charles H. and his son, Al Bart, bought number 56 um, in 1880. This painting from 1885 by Char James Franklin Gilman, who um, was an itinerant pa painter, shows the Cross family. Um, as we have seen it, um, as we have seen, Al Bart lived just down the hill from number 56 on School Street. He must have used the woods path sometimes. Al Bart sold refrigerators from number 56, according to the ad in the papers, probably out of the barn shown here that is now gone. I imagine the ladies walking arm in arm are thankful for the plank sidewalk making it a little easier to navigate the mud and horse manure with long dresses. Maybe they are Eliza and Phoebe Guernsey. Um, the current building looks quite good for its age and has long been rented out for offices. The old curved drive has been replaced by a parking lot. The portrait here is Gershon Brigham, Brigham who built number 56. Number 58. Uh, East State Street is an impressive building um, made of brick at the corner of East State and Hubbard Streets. It was built in 1901 for the Union School's first and third graders, first, first through third graders. It stayed a city school until the present Union Elementary School on, on School Street opened in 1940, after which it was used by the Catholic School for a while and for public school administrative offices. It was sold by the school district in 1982 to the Vermont Rehab Partnership and turned into offices. In 1882, um, East State Street was becoming more settled and uh, the architect George H. Guernsey 
built number 68 for his family at the upper corner of Hubbard and East State Street. His wife was Alpha, and they had one daughter, Mary. George was the son of Gilman Guernsey, a master builder in Callis who built the East Callis Church that still stands. George helped his father with building projects in his youth, and after serving in the Civil War, um, and uh, he, his family moved to Montpelier, where he would have a huge impact. Um, and uh, by the way, he spent two years as uh, Montpelier's mayor. Um, it is, this has gone through a, color, a few color schemes. Mm -hmm. George designed many um, Montpelier buildings, including the Catholic Church, Redstone, the brick Dewey House on East State Street, and the beautiful turreted house at 69 Barry Street at the corner of Hubbard, owned by the Rivellini family. He also designed three iron bridges in town that have since been replaced and he died at age 60 of consumption, having designed 20 churches and dozens of buildings all over Vermont. Well-known historian Paul Heller's father owned number 68 in the mid to late 1900s, and Paul remembers being up on a ladder painting this house as a teenager. In 1875, two devastating fires in Montpelier destroyed a large number of buildings downtown. Um, as you can see in the picture, newspapers report that number 56, um, is the, number 56 that we just were talking about and number 100 coming up in Paul's section had cinders from the downtown fires blow up the hill onto their roofs. The fire wagons saved them and other buildings from burning. George Guernsey designed five of the retail um, blocks that rose from the ashes after uh, 1875. The French, Hyde, Rialto, Union, and Walton blocks. All but one survive. The Union block burned in 1914 and was rebuilt. The Rialto block over the Winooski was extensively remodeled. Guernsey later designed the Blanchard block in the mid-1880s. The names of these blocks are still visible at the tops of the brick facades on most of them. To continue um, uh, up East State Street, here's a panorama um, around 1900. Is this, are you starting? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. That's okay. <laughs> no problem. Um, so this is, um, as Jennifer was saying, this is a detail from a panoramic photograph. Um, and some of the buildings that, this is 55 that um, Jennifer was just talking no, about. No, it's uh, to the left. Yeah? Keep going. Keep going. Oh, there we go, there we go, sorry. Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, okay. In the corner of the Union School. Um, whoops. And this is the next house on our itinerary. Um, standing alone, which it doesn't any longer, without any houses next to it. This is 72 East State Street. The nominating papers for the National Register for Historic Places says, quote, a significant and somewhat typical vernacular example of the Second Empire style architecture in Montpelier. The house was constructed sometime between 1884, when a bird's eye view of the city was published, which shows no house, and 1890, when occupants are first listed in the city directory. From 1890 until shortly after the turn of the century, the house was occupied by Charles de Forest Bancroft, a tinsmith who also served as a justice of the peace, lister, and sheriff." Unquote. That was all from the nominating papers. Bancroft, the resident of this house, was actually a very interesting person. He was much more than a, quote, tinsmith who also served as a justice of the peace, lister, and sheriff. He was a reporter for the Green Mountain Freeman, which, as we've seen, had offices at the bottom of the hill. He was also the compiler of Montpelier's incomparable city censuses of 1860, 70, 80, and 1895, 1905, and 1915, an invaluable resource for anyone doing Montpelier history. By 1918, he had an office in the Opera House block, which we now call the Blanchard block, working as a, quote, naturalization intermediary, genealogist, and statistician, unquote. 
I've seen a letter he wrote to naturalization officials on behalf of a Russian Jewish family who lived in Montpelier, certifying their birth dates in Russia and the date of their immigration to the United States. How we could certify these facts, I do not know, but it was a different era in terms of documenting facts. And he was certainly very interested in helping Montpelier's immigrant populations and documenting where they lived in the city in his censuses. Here's the Bancroft House in 2019. The register nominating papers go on to say, quote, the house appears to be divided into a duplex with two tenants by 1904, divided further in 1933 with the addition of an apartment and subdivided yet again in the 1940s with the addition of two more apartments, unquote. The trajectory of the building in this, in this structure uh, is admired today for increasing household density. This is one of the most recognizable houses on East State Street, but unfortunately we don't have a historical photograph of it. From the National Register nominating papers, this building had a varied history as a single family and multifamily dwelling. Quote, first appearing in the directories in, 19, in 1898, the duplex was occupied by Patty W. Huntington and Frank A. Hayden, a tenant. By 1925, the directories show the house was occupied by Clarence H. Dempsey, the State Commissioner of Education. From 1933 to 1969 directories, the house was occupied by Dr. W. Douglas Lindsay family. And in 1974, the building was converted into a boarding house by the LaRose family. Unquote. That was all from the nominating papers. John and Betsy Anderson bought it in 1990 and opened Betsy's B&B, which they ran here for 27 years. It's now back to being a private residence. And right next door, we do have a historic photograph. This is 7678 East State Street, photographed in 1917. This house appears in the city directories for the first time in 1898, just like its neighbor. The National Register says that, quote, it is one of the, a few formerly symmetrical Queen Anne style duplexes in Montpelier. Unquote. Note that one of the definitions of Queen Anne houses is usually their asymmetry. This one was built symmetrically. Also, like its neighbor at one time, it was home of an upper level educator. You note on the back of this picture, written by local historian and collector Norman B.E. Kent, says, quote, May 20th, 1917, at 76 East State Street, the tenement on the left lived Frederick Edwards, principal of the high school and an intimate friend of Mr. and Mrs. D.B.E. Kent. The next house up the hill is 100 East State Street, the big brick house that is now offices. Let's step back in time a bit in distance and look at how this house, seen here high above Union School in the 1870s, became this house with a mansard roof in the same location, and then became this house an imposing brick classical revival house still in the same location. The house seen in many long distance views of Montpelier's downtown is the home of carriage maker and horse breeder F.C. Gilman. I don't know the date of the building, but it isn't on the 1858 Wallings map, but it is on the 1873 Beers Atlas. So sometime between 1858 and 73. Successful farmer and landowner Morton Marvin purchased it from Gilman in 1881, just before East State Street was opened up. Marvin proceeded to build terraces and a lot of stairs in front of the house and remodeled it in the French Second Empire style, including a mansard roof. You can see the road bed for East State Street right there. And the terraces, many there. Uh, that may actually accommodate some of the houses that we just saw. So those houses were probably built up on those terraces. Um, Marvin also planted many fruit trees in front of this building, according to another picture that we have. This is what the Marvin house looked like up close. It was a very handsome building, not unlike other buildings with mansard roofs scattered around Montpelier and indeed, as we've seen on East State Street itself. 
We will learn more about the extended Barton family a little bit later. Barry Granite manufacturer Hugh J.M. Jones purchased the home from Marwin in 1898. He tore it down in 1907 and built the brick classical revival house that stands on the site today. Here is the newspaper article announcing his plans. Hugh Jones was one of the partners in the Jones Brothers Granite Company, whose granite sheds are now the Vermont Granite Museum on the Barry Montpelier Road. Interestingly, he had his his draftsman designed the house. This is what they created. It has a few granite elements, but is mainly brick. This is what the house looked like when the Jones family lived there. The next family to live there was the family of Dr. G.J. Bertrand, who moved here in 1950. This is a photo from the Bertrand family, with their dog there in the front. According to son Fred Bertrand, who grew up in this house and became mayor of Montpelier and CEO of Natural Life, quote, the first floor had a big living room with fireplace, kitchen, kitchen with tables and chairs, a big entrance and beautiful staircase to the second floor, a den with fireplace where we spent most of our time, a piano, a very large dining room with a big table with expansion leaves, and last but not least, a bathroom. Also a fairly large mudroom, very visible from East State Street. The second floor had four large bedrooms and a bathroom. There were two servant rooms and a bathroom in a separate area over the kitchen. There was a door with lock between the servant area and the bedrooms. There were many social events, mainly family and holiday parties, as my father had three brothers and a sister in the area. My mother was from Burlington and her family also visited." Unquote. In 1960, the building was sold to Vermont Junior College and it became known as Jones Hall, although there is evidence they were using it as a dorm before they actually owned the building. I stumbled on this interesting clipping published on August, <laughs> published on August 3rd, 1959, in Evening Argus, when doing research on the buildings, on this building, for an article on the Vermont College campus that appeared in the bridge last summer tells about a famous national political columnist named Raymond Moley, who stayed in the house at 100 East State Street and wrote several of his columns while he vacationed in Montpelier. Though it seemed to be very much a working vacation since he was very productive. The building served as a dormitory, as seen here in a detail of a campus map, until March 1976, when it was sold to Lawrence Heaney, and it became a private residence once again. City Councilor and Realtor Tim Heaney spent some of his childhood here. It's now owned by Granite Hill Partners for professional offices. This is a perfect place to turn the microphone over to Jennifer again for a discussion of the College Green. It's offices. Okay. Um, in the mid-1800s, we're stepping back again here. Um, in the mid-1800s, when East State Street was still a mud track, the level area at the top of, um, was a fairground and a horse racing oval. Horse breeding and racing were popular in this rural state that used so much horsepower. Then, towards the end of the Civil War in the 1860s, the Sloan General Hospital was built on that spot for the, um, for the, the, battle, the battlefield camps, uh, the battlefield camps and field hospitals were risky environments, so soldiers were sent um, to hospitals closer to home. Two-thirds of the um, military fatalities were caused by disease, and one-third mostly from bullet wounds. The hospital stayed um, in use for two years. Why is it doing that? I don't know. Here, let me just Um, the hospital stayed in use for two years, and then the campus was sold to a private school, the Vermont Methodist Seminary. Um, this was a high school. Many wards were moved and used to build the first dorms. Um, others were separated into house side sections and moved all over sem the Seminary Hill area. Note that this is a great picture. Um, Note the numerous board fences, which uh, look like roads, but they're not. 
This picture was probably taken from the same high hill across the Minuski where, oh, never mind. Um, uh, take note of 110 East State Street at the far left that still stands. Uh, it's the only farmhouse in barn on the left side on East State Street. More of that, about that building in a minute. 99 slash 101 East State Street is, is one of the 15 houses that still exist that were built from segments of the wards of the Sloan Civil War Hospital in 1868 after the Civil War ended. Um, this one was built by the seminary and was sold to Nellie J. Hayford in 1894. Later, Frank A. Sherburn, um, you'll hear about him later, uh, owner of a neighboring house on the corner of West Street, ran it as a tenement. It's been a tenement ever since. It's speculation that both parts of the building are ward sections, um, but they both um, match pictures of the hospital grounds. Um, the, the L is definitely an old ward section. Here are two more buildings um, moved from the Sloan Hospital on East State Street when it was sold to the Methodist Seminary in 1868. Um, you can see the signature placement of windows that all the hospital buildings share. There is a pair of windows on the gable end, second floor, not the usual single window most houses had at the time. And also the eaves are quite thin. The drawing is from the original architectural plans when the hospital um, was built. And it shows those two windows. 110 East State Street was probably built around the same time as the Civil War Hospital and may have been part of it. Um, the close up of the house on the left is from an 1867 photo of the hospital grounds. You can see some of the hospital, hospital buildings and the fence surrounding it. I love the smoke coming out of the chimney. Um, the 1990 picture on the upper left shows the barn turned 90 degrees. I imagine it became a four-car garage to move along with the times. However, um, now it is a residential space. Um, now we're going to hear from George and more houses. This is the house at the corner of West and East State Street, numbered 11 West Street. It currently houses the Montpelier New School. Frank Sherbert bought the land from the seminary in 1892 and built the house in 1895. Frank Avon Sherbert was born in Corinth, Vermont in 1858. The family moved to Montpelier when he was young and he attended Montpelier Public Schools graduating from Montpelier High School and the Methodist Seminary. He married Josephine Gill, a fellow student. In 1875, at the age of 17, he started working at Putnam and Marvin Crockery and Grocery Store at 40 and 42 Main Street. 13 years later, when Enoch Putnam retired, Frank became a full partner, and the new firm was called Marvin and Sherburn. Mr. Sherbert was an active and successful local businessman and an active real estate investor, owning a number of pieces of real estate over the years with properties on Tremont, Ridge, First Avenue, College, and East State Street. He was also very busy in civic affairs, being active in the fire department, the Board of Trade, the YMCA, Trinity Methodist Church, the Art Fellows, the Modern Woodman, and the Heaton Hospital Board. He was a member of the original board at the hospital. Here we see Frank Sherburn, the second from the left in front of his grocery store and provision store at numbers 42, 40 and 42 Main Street. This space is where Summers Hardware was and where Abishan Hardware is now. You can still see the name French's Block, 1875, at the top of the brick facade. And we remember that George Guernsey designed this and other buildings after the big 1875 fire. Another thing of note in this picture is that they're featuring s and green stamps. They were invented in the very early 1900s, and Marvin and Sherburn 
and later Sherburn and Flint were leaders in the movement. Frank was partners with Thomas Marvin, who died at age 49. He then became partners with Mr. Flint. The Marvin family comes up again later. Here's an early ad for egg white soap from Marvin and Sherburn at 40 and 42 Main Street. It is made to produce the same effect as whites of eggs and sweet cream, 10 cents per cake. And here's an ad from the store once it had changed its name to Sherbert and Flint, 40 and 42 Main Street, featuring groceries, woodenware, and baskets and items in our China store. Here is a dish featuring the old Pavilion Hotel. These items were made in England and made especially for Marvin and Sherburn. It was not uncommon to sell items that were imported as private label or store brand items. They featured numbers of souvenir type images. I have purchased a number of these on eBay. The Marvin family connection is what makes them of interest to me, maybe of less interest to my wife. <laughs> Here is a representation of the Vermont Methodist Seminary and Female College campus. College Hall was built about 1870. The dorm was built about the same time. This card is dated 1882. This is a closer look of the dorm. That building was there in my time, and it was used for many, many years. It was a dorm for Vermont Junior College in the 50s and replaced by Noble Hall in 1957 and Bishop Hatch Hall the following year. It was built from sections of Sloan Hospital wards in the 1860s. They moved four long wards and jacked them up to add new first floors. Note the signature double windows on the left gable ends. A different view of the same area with a dorm on the left portion. The other three buildings were college buildings made from Sloan Hospital buildings. One of them is still there. It sits behind the library to the right and was most recently called Martin Hall. It's been moved, but it looks very similar to that building right there. I found on a census that my great-grandmother, Eva Marvin, lived in that house at one time. This ancestry tree section tells the story that while Frank Avon Sherburn and his wife Josephine were building a house on the corner of West Street and East State Street, their daughter Eunice was connecting with Mr. Robert B. Jones, who lived across the street. Frank was building his house on that corner at about the same time that Hugh John Morris Jones was building the property at 100 East State Street, and the two of them married later. Actually, the two of them were grandparents of my friend, Hugh John Morris Jones III, that I went to Montpelier High School with. Frank Sherbert bought land on the corner of College Street and East State Street and built this house in 1905. He sold his house on West Street and built this house at 56 College Street. This sandboard map shows the house on the corner of East State and College, number 56 College Street. This is the garage before it was connected to the house. Note the 110 white farmhouse and barn left of that, which we talked about before. Also, North Hall Dormitory on the lower right, part of the old Civil War Hospital. Shows here where the gymnasium parking lot is today. So my great-grandfather, Thomas Marvin, built this house in 1897 at 7 West Street. He built it at the age of 47 and died at the age of 49. So let's go back to our 1884 map produced by George Norris and drawn by Mr. Poole. At the left, we have the corner of State and Main with East State going up to the right. We have talked about at least seven buildings in this stretch. East State continues above Hubbard Street, and we have talked about at least nine buildings on this section. 
Jennifer will have copies of the large 1800s maps of Montpelier. If you want to look at them later, they're on the tables as you, uh, as you leave. To end this program, we thought we would share this treat with you. This crowd is watching a dramatic sledding event on East State Street, a common one in the depths of winter. They pile six to eight people onto a 10 foot long, heavy traverse sled used by anyone who did winter logging at that time. The coasters, as the sledders were called, would slide all the way from the top of East State Street to the other side of the Rialto Bridge. They would even do this at night with electric lamps. Newspapers note that Thomas Marvin, Sherman and Marvin grocers, allowed the community to use his land at the top of the hill for the coasting. Just to the north of that is Marvin Street, built in later decades. At the bottom of the slide is a picture of a trapper's sled that is on display at Morse's Sugar House. The age of the automobile put an end to all this fun. <laughs> Thank you very much for coming, and we will welcome your questions. <laughs> yes? Uh, brief uh, word on racing on East State Street. In the late 1950s, during the soapbox derby craze, that is where the races took place. My brother Richard won twice, and then came in second one year, he never got over it. And his race car, a piece of shit, made from crap in our cellar, is now in the collection of the Vermont Historians. <laughs> Anybody else? Yes. This is just slightly off topic, but I wonder if you could just say a couple of words about the arsenal uh, around the corner off of uh, College Street. Uh, no. I no. <laughs> well, but yeah, no, no, let, me, let me quickly say that, because in a way I go back the furthest, but I, uh, I remember when the old arsenal buildings were there, and the, the cross baking, uh, that truck that was in the flood, my family bought that back from some farmers in Worcester. Some years later, we still have that truck in our, in our possession today. And uh, the truck was, uh, was stored in one of those arsenal buildings, so I had reason to be in an arsenal building uh, from time to time. They were just storage buildings in my time. There was a tennis court to the left on that property, a private tennis court, clay, that we, we played on a lot. Uh, but that's that's just my personal. And approach. didn't it burn? But, yeah. yeah. Um, so it was, it was an arsenal for the, during the Civil War. There was a whole. So and, so there's a there's a there's a um, hint on East State Street about where the big buildings were. Like that little brick building is <coughs> tiny, and there was these big buildings along the along along College Street. You see. Um, granite pillars and iron poles. And anywhere that's behind that had those big buildings behind it. So Right. I think I think the what I had heard was that it was built at the same time as the Civil War Hospital and it was sort of um, part of the deal um, to put a hospital there and then the state would get the, the arsenal as well. Um, and I think it was hit by lightning in the nineteen 40s, right? Was it 40 even? Um, and the state was storing a lot of records in there, and um, that those those records were burned, including Civil War um, records. Um, so what you see now is just the uh, I think it was the uh, the superintendents or the uh, uh, you know the people who, who managed the arsenal is their their cottage. And College Street was was named Arsenal Street for a period of time. It'd be interesting to know how long we've seen maps with College Street named Arsenal Street. Remember? The uh, I wonder if there's any history on this. My father uh, clearly remembers that where they used to run that Travis sled down from actually up where the Kingstead is or that area down there right by the Main Street School. And there was a terrible accident with the kids uh, on there. Either two or three of them were killed. 
uh, and he happened to be at the top of the hill and decided not to slide down. And uh, that's true. Good for me. Worked out for you. Well, I, I have one more little thing about oops, about that. Uh, I've met someone who used to take traffic sleds with friends from the height of land just south of East Montpelier Center and end up in downtown Montpelier. <laughs> People were crazy back then. <laughs> And a lot of the traverse runs were done standing up, is my understanding. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard this. Yeah, in full, women in full skirts. Yes. Yeah. But a lot of buildings have been moved over the years, but also a lot of hillsides have been moved. Mm -hmm. And it's just mind boggling to think about how much soil was moved around. To, um, to, uh, Relating to that, um, fr a friend reminded me that that whole area of kind of north and east of downtown was called Clay Hill. Yeah. And that's what it is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we have a lot more information on the wall. We could have made a 15 minute kind of talk just about the wall. Uh, and that's fascinating. But the thing that interests me the most is that wall was conceived in like April and it was finished in like November. And from beginning to end, it was talked about before, but when they first decided to actually do it, it was just months. Today it would be years. Yes? I don't go back far enough to know the history of what happened after the a &P. What was the next grocery store in Montclair? When did the Shaw's building go? Uh, the Grand Union was already there. Yeah. Okay. That came before Shaw's. So did that have to do with the demise of the a &P? Does anybody know? In my day, in the 50s, in the 50s, uh, it was A&P and First National downtown. I would go shopping with my mother at the First National, uh, we're in the Cody Block or the A&P. That was it. And then they each uh, closed and went to the very much clear road. I'm not sure what the Shaw uh, timing was, but anyway, that's what those have. That, those were the two. And there's no other shop, no other supermarket. There were IGAs, and the IGAs were very, uh, very active neighborhood IGAs. And there were a lot of mom and pops. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. The mom and pops sold groceries. The mom Capital mom. market. Yeah. Steve's. Steve's. I don't think I, I don't think I, We, uh, the bakery, uh, Cross Bakery was in the middle of Montpelier, and you make your bread the day before you sell it. So Sunday was the day that we made bread. And so on Sunday, uh, we would go out to all the Montpelier stores and bring them fresh bread. And you couldn't stack it too high because it would, it would collapse. It was hot. And so, uh, you know, six, eight, ten different stores in Montpelier would get bread that was an hour old. Mary? Um, this, uh, the, the flooding on State Street, I remember my father telling me the story of, um, so I, I'm, I'm thinking this might have been about 1910. His younger sister was sliding down the hill in, in full throttle. And um, all of a sudden, the fire trucks, which were horse drawn, comes flying out from, yeah. from, the, from the side there. And um, the, the guy driving the, the horses sees this little kid coming down the hill. And, and that guy was Norm Darkman's father. He, um, he purposely overturned the, the fire truck, saving this little kid. Um, but because he had really messed up the fire truck, he, he was fired for that. Well, and, you know, never mind. Uh, fascinating historic perspective. Thank you for the effort to see the transformation of East State over time. Um, looking to the future, I'll note that the uh, City Public Works Department has a proposal 
on the drawing board to add a bike lane and a sidewalk as you go uphill from uh, Hubbard and East State on the south side of the road for pedestrian safety and bicycle safety. Uh, it would be a multi-million dollar project calling for retaining walls below 100 East State. Uh, substantial work on the south side that would interfere with the properties on uh, First Ave. And so people who are want to be mindful and and keep our historic uh, accuracy may take an interest in the project. Uh, I, I meant to um, mention about that other side that hovers over, um, you know, the, the first place on the left on First Avenue, you know, because that's a long stretch and that's a cliff. Yeah. I mean, it is straight down. That project has not been approved or finalized. It's not been approved, but uh, been apparently Public Works will take it to City Council um, in good, future good months. Because it's City Council. <laughs> I, I, I said they, you know, because pedestrians coming up East State by the wall are prompted to cross, and I, I could solve the pedestrian problem with $200 worth of signs. The city wants to spend millions of dollars and disrupt properties. Anything else? Thank you very much for coming. Uh,